Right. Well, I'm online. So if you guys want to ask some questions, we got about three minutes or so. I have a question about the uh, lecture on the 23rd. I was wondering if that was ever going to be put up on YouTube because it's been a, about a week now. On the 23rd? Yeah, I couldn't find the 23rd, but I could, find, but I could also find uh, the lecture for the 25th last Wednesday and um, uh, March 16th, the Monday before last month. All right. Let's see. I got the 16th, the 11th, 3rd, 9th. Okay, somebody posted a bunch last week. So which day again? The 23rd? Uh, yeah, the 23rd. Uh, I think it was also that day where... The 23rd uh, is on, it's actually on uh, the Discord messages. Is uh, it? Yep, you just have to scroll up enough to find it. I can put a link down here too. Oh, okay, so it, it's before March 18th. Uh, the one on March 18th is because somebody asked for it, and um, I think Alex was the one who found all the links and posted, you know, all of them. Uh, okay, makes sense. There you go. All right, any other questions? I'm just taking a look at my OBS, making sure that it is pointing to the right places. Yep, looks like it. All right, so I'm just going to go back here. And Today is the 30th, so today is the due date of the resolution and proof by contradiction homework assignment. All right, we got a few seconds to go. I actually do also have a clarifying question. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Proof, proof by contradiction is only possible through resolution. No, it is not. But in the homework assignment, I want you guys to only prove by contradiction using resolution. Okay. So not in general, but in your homework assignment, I only want to focus on resolution. Because resolution is, uh, is very easy to implement mechanically. Um, and that's why I want to kind of focus on that one. Because, you know, you know the whole idea is we want to perform theorem proving um, you know, using mechanical methods as much as possible. And resolution is very, very, extremely mechanical from that perspective. Okay. All right. So it is noon time. So I got a few things to share with you guys. You know, some are not too related to this class, but nonetheless, it's kind of interesting. Um, so at the Design Hub, and Carol probably has joined us. Yep, Carol has joined us. So we are starting a project um, to implement our own ventilator. So the design hub is uh, joining the the bandwagon of you know uh, researching yeah. and possibly yeah. producing that. Go, go ahead. Okay, now there we go. So we are um, possibly join joining the bandwagon of uh, uh, making uh, ventilators. Um, and you know, I just finished up a call this morning with um, a res respiratory system expert on ARC campus. Okay, so uh, so we got some really kind of useful information, and the design has to be, eh, let's just say, refined slash changed a little bit. Um, so that's kind of oh, interesting. That's Go ahead. No, that's all. I was just I had been watching the video beforehand, um, and yeah. Uh, that we need to add um, pure oxygen to the system now, and then yes. make sure we're yes. doing that properly. 
Yes. Yeah. So the idea is, uh, in order to help any patient uh, with COVID-19, um, just ambient air is not going to cut it because the problem is not that these people cannot breathe. The problem is they cannot. Uh, the oxygen cannot get into the bloodstream. So it's not about you know, pumping air into these people because as if that air only has ambient air, which is about 21% oxygen, it's not going to. It's not going to be enough. Um, so we will have to blend, uh, be able to blend a ratio of pure oxygen into the airstream going into the patient. So I got a different design now, but that's kind of off topic. But I just want to let the class know that you know the design hub, you know, or ARC in general, is actually trying to do something to, uh, you know, about this situation. So that's kind of cool. Um, as Randy said, you know, we, we hope nobody actually will need to use the ventilators that we produce, but um, we hope that, uh, you know, we'll still be learning something and be able to help when it is needed. Yeah, it's always good to have emergency backups to your backups. <laughs> yep, that is true. Okay. So what we'll do is we go, we're going to go through the homework assignment first, and then we'll go back and look at a... Uh, an earlier test because you know next well no, I shouldn't say next week but after spring break we're gonna have our second exam and yes we I am grading the first exam so but after the uh, spring break I will will have the second exam and I think I have a general idea of how I want to do it um, so we'll be collecting some opinions you know when I get to that part but first thing first let's go to the homework assignment and I got a few questions about um, this homework assignment. So let me see if all of those questions are addressed when I you know, go through this, when I uh, work out the solution. So I'm just going to work out the solution using mouse pad uh, because if I use the notation that is using multiplication and addition and the exclamation point, I think it will be fine using just uh, notepad. All right, so we'll work with the first proposed theorem first, okay? So this is a proposed theorem, which means it may or may not be an actual theorem. And same thing for the second one. It may or may not be an actual theorem. We have to basically find out whether it is or not, okay? So th that's one thing that I did not make very clear, that these are proposed theorems only. They are only statements, but they are not necessarily theorems already. All right, so the first one is T implies SR, or S and R, okay? So what we want to do is to negate it first, okay? So I'm going to put this one over here because we'll be staying on this screen for a while. So this is proposed theorem one. And the first thing we need to do with proof by contradiction is to negate the theorem first. So the negated proposed theorem one it's really to negate the entire thing. So we are negating T implies S and R. Okay. So now we need to figure out, okay, so how do we simplify this? The first thing we do, the first thing I would do is to convert, uh, get rid of the implication using the definition of implication. So in this case, it will be the negation of T or S and R. And now we have the negation. Let me focus on which one. So now we have this negation, which is applied to a disjunction, which means that we can now apply the Morgan's law. So with the Morgan's law, in this case, we have not, not t because it's negating the entire not t on the left-hand side, and then we convert the disjunction into a conjunction, and after that we have the negation of s and r. So we can simplify the first one; it is simply t. The second one can use um, De Morgan's law again, because this negation is applied to the conjunction between S R. So now we have not S or not R, like that, and that is C and F. Okay, this is a this is in conjunctive normal form already, because we have a overall disjunction, which is this blinky cursor here. And then each term of the conjunction is a disjunctive term. So do we have any questions about the C and F of the negated proposed theorem? 
no questions. All right. So without any questions here, then we go back to the question because it already says, you know, the solution of the previous homework assignment would give us this particular CNF. So now we switch back and we say combining um, well-formed formulae in the iota and the negated theorem, then we have the following. So we just copy and paste that one. And we also copy and paste this one over here. So now the question is, can we resolve this? Okay, is there anything for us to resolve? So now would be a good time to kind of show you guys how I would do this systematically. So the way I usually do it is I would fix the I would fix the first disjunctive term to be the first one first, and then I will see if it can resolve with the second, the third, and the fourth. So focusing on this being the first one, it cannot resolve with the second one because uh, they have identical not Q, not R, and then one has not S, the other one has T, so they cannot be resolved. It cannot resolve with the third one because um, they don't even share the same variable, so they cannot be resolved. It cannot resolve with the last one because um, the only thing, the only variables, well, there are two variables that are common. Uh, one is R and the other one is S, but they are both negated in both disjunctive terms. In fact, you can generalize or you can just simplify and get rid of one of them, but it doesn't matter because, you know, at this point we can conclude that there is no resolution applicable, okay? So we can say no resolution is applicable, but zero is missing from the final CNF as a result um, the proposed theorem is not a theorem. So that is the conclusion because we cannot get to the contradiction and yet there are no resolution per, you know, uh, applicable. So we are basically saying okay you know we we just cannot prove that it is a theorem. Is that okay? Now to say that the original proposed theorem or the proposed statement is not a theorem is not to say that it is false. All it is saying is it does not follow what we are, what we know to be true to begin with. Okay, so there's a there's a very important difference between those two statements. Do we have any questions about those statements? No questions? All right. All right, so that's the for the first part. So now we move on to the second part. The second part starts with a statement like this. So we switch back to here and then we say proposed theorem 2 is this. So now once again, we have to negate the proposed theorem 2, which is the negation of Q and R implies T. So now we need to see how we can turn the negated theorem into a CNF. So the negated theorem has an implication, so we'll go ahead and take care of the implication first. So we have the negation of Q and R implies or or the negation of that or T. And then we can apply the Morgan's law. Okay, so we will apply the Morgan's law to this negation applied to this conjunction. So now we have not Q or not R. Now, a lot of these parentheses are actually not needed, but I'm putting those there, you know, just so that it is clear how we distribute the negation into the components of the conjunction when we apply the Morgan's law. So now we look at this and go like, hmm, I think we can simplify the inside quite a bit because the inside is really just not Q or not R or T. Right. So are there any questions at this point? I just removed a whole bunch of parentheses that are not needed. So are we good so far? All right, so if that is good, and uh, we're gonna apply the Morgan's Law again. So the Morgan's Law applied to multiple terms as well. In other words, in this case, we can basically say we apply or well, we distribute the negation into each component of the disjunction, but then we have to turn the entire disjunction into a gigantic conjunction. 
So we have not not q, and not not r, and not t. And then if we do a simplification, then we just have q as one term, r as one term, and then not t as the other term. And now it is in C and F. Do we have any questions about how we start with the proposed second proposed theorem and negate it first and then turn the negated theorem into a CNF? All right, no questions. If there are no questions, now we combine it with what we know to be true to begin with. So what we know to be true to begin with is this part here, which is the solution of the first assignment, or the CNF assignment. So now we start with this, and then we combine it with basically what was the negated theorem. It still really means the same thing. In other words, okay, let me explain what I mean by that. If you make a truth table using, not this one, sorry, if you make a truth table using this particular statement, which is just a Boolean expression, um, th you will find that the value of this particular column is going to be the same as this column. If you make two columns, then this column, or the truth values of this column, is going to be identical to the column corresponding to this expression. In other words, uh, we have not changed the meaning of the negated theorem at all. We just change how it is expressed. Are there any questions about that statement? Okay, I'm just reading the Discord part. Nothing. So nobody has a question. And I'm just going to double check and make sure my live stream is still up because last time I didn't get any questions from you guys. It was because the live stream was from Discord is broken. There we go. It's still good. All right. <coughs> So now we can perform resolution, and we'll s basically use the same technique. I focus on the first disjunctive term, and then we ask, can it resolve with the other uh, uh, disjunctive terms? Well, the first one cannot you know, resolve with this one, because um, the variables they do, they do share, they're all negated on both sides, and then S and T are not even shared. Okay, fine. Then we look at this one, and we ask, can they resolve with the third one? The answer is yes, it, they can resolve because they share a variable q, but in one it is negated, and in the other one it is not negated. So in that case, we can combine these two and turn it into the, dis into the concatenation of the rest of each expression. The rest of the first expression is really just this part. The rest of the second expression, well, implicitly it is the same thing as a plus zero or, or or false, but that really doesn't need to be spelled out. So basically, after this, the first resolution, we end up with um, a new term. Okay, so I'm going, I'm, I'll copy and paste first, and then I'm going to use um, some indicator to tell us how we are resolving. Okay, so it is because of this term that we can resolve with this term over here. Okay, so that as a result, we now add the result of the resolution as part of the CNF. So what is left is not R or not S. Okay, do we have any questions about this step? The part about, you know, the result of a resolution is appended to the original CNF. No questions. All right. All right. So when you then we look at these four terms, but we're not quite done yet, okay? Because we were focusing, we were focusing on the first disjunctive term, and now we look at the uh, the fourth item, and realize that hey, they do share a variable r. It is negated on one and non-negated on the other one. So we can resolve those two. Now, some of you probably spotted that we can actually do the resolution a whole lot faster and easier, but I'm doing it in a very, very mechanical way, just so that you know you can see how this can be implemented as a computer as a program using just a double loop and be able to perform the same thing. So the um, the single 
dash is indicating basically just the extent of the disjunctive term and then the equal sign is to to highlight you know, which variable do I use for that resolution so when I resolve these two I would end up with not Q or not S as a new term so now I go copy and paste and add a new term which is not Q or not S because the R is quote unquote canceled out or it is the connector um, component to connect the two disjunctive terms alright so now we look at the, the first disjunctive term and then we ask can it resolve with the last one the answer is no because they do not share the same um, variable okay but that's before now it is after because now we got a new term over here but because these two new terms introduced are both uh, due to resolution of the first disjunctive term with some other terms we already know that the first disjunctive term cannot resolve with these two because it is coming out of itself so now we look at this and ask let's look at the second disjunctive term and ask can it resolve with any of the other disjunctive terms but not the first one because we have already explored that and you look at this you look at Q and go like yep we can definitely resolve those two and as and uh, let me just re-emphasize that this is a very inefficient way of doing this because we if we do it by hand we can uh, make it a lot faster but I want to show the that this whole process can be mechanical and it's relatively easy to make it mechanical okay so these two can now resolve and as, as a result of that particular resolution we end up with a new term which is not Q or T okay and then we look at the second term and then we ask what else can it resolve oh I forgot about the Q I skipped to the R but I forgot about the Q okay so let's go ahead and do that one too so we look at the not Q and then we look at the Q and go like ah these two can resolve okay so we resolve and as a result of that we now have not R or T as a new term okay now that's not getting us anywhere not yet okay now we look at this term and ask okay what can it resolve with not T the answer is yes okay so we can now resolve that so we have the T connecting with the not T and as a result of this resolution we end up with a new term of not Q or not R okay and then we look at this and we ask well what else can it resolve with so we look at this term and then we look further and ask can it resolve with not R or not S nope can it resolve with not Q or not S nope can it resolve with not Q or T nope can it resolve with not R or T the answer is no so we are now totally done with the second term now we can focus on the third term so we ask can it resolve with R no can it resolve with not T no can it resolve with not R or not S no can it resolve with not Q or not S the answer is yes okay so we have located that resolution so we take this Q we take this not Q and then resolve these two terms okay so we now have a new term and now your solution doesn't have to look this nasty because this is unnecessarily long so if you recognize you know the, f the few steps that you actually need to get to a contradiction you can certainly go that route too but I just want to illustrate the mechanical nature of doing it this way so we look at not T again and oh. No, we are looking we're still looking at Q okay so we look at Q we look at not Q here and we c these two can also resolve okay so we say this Q which is non-negated 
can also resolve with this not Q or T because this not Q is negated. And as a result of this resolution, we end up with a new term which is just T itself. Let me double check. Yep, it is just T by itself. All right. So if you are um, careful and you already have worked up to this point, you can say, Tech, don't do this anymore. Don't do the Q versus not Q anymore because this Q can also resolve with this not Q over here. But that's really just a waste of time because I have already seen this not T and also this T over here. If these two resolve, we'll end up with a contradiction right there. We are done. You're correct, okay? But that's because you know we are not doing it you know purely mechanically. If I do it purely mechanically, I would have a few more steps to go. But you know, just because of the time issue, we're just going to say, yep, we find this not t, and we find this t over here. So now we can resolve those two, okay? And the result of resolving those two is false. So once we get to the false. We can now say, since um, the negated theorem leads to a contradiction, the pr negated proposed theorem, I should say, the proposed oops, theorem is actually a theorem. And that's it. So do we have any questions about the homework assignment? Once again, if you get to the contradiction a lot faster because you didn't do it mechanically and systematically like this, that's fine. Okay, it will take I think you know just maybe two or three steps to get to the contradiction if you didn't quite do it this Did mechanically. Go ahead. Uh, oh, I have one question. Yeah. So with resolution, mm -hmm. it, uh, equation gets longer, right? Um, uh, when I solved it, yeah, like you said, I made the equation smaller, like reducing terms. Can that cause problems in some cases? Well, if you, okay, so it depends on what you what you mean when you say I can make it you know smaller. Um, the the terms that are generated out of this are concatenations of the original terms. I'm I'm just give you an example here. So when you look mm -hmm. at this term here, when it resolves with this term here, um, the T and the not T quote unquote cancels out or they act as a connector. But the not T doesn't really have any additional components and that's why what is left is not Q or not R and then we put not Q or not R at the end of the original CNF. Okay, so the way I had did it was so yeah, analyzing that the not t is mm -hmm. what was important out of all that, and mm -hmm. then just getting rid of the t in the other disjunction. Mm -hmm. Um, is but you have to oh, go ahead. It doesn't cause a problem as long as you understand that the result that you generate out of resolution. Can itself be used in a f in a fur in a resolution further down the process. Okay. Okay. So the notation is not as important. You know, I think you're referring to the notation of where to where to put um, the term that is generated as a result of a resolution. Like this term is the result of a resolution step. So the question is, where do we put this? The the best way to put this is to append it to the CNF. The reason why we can append it to the CNF is because um, basically the resolution proof itself says if you have something like this and this, okay, then it implies this. In other words, if you look at this entire thing, you know, what we are starting off with, if you look at this thing that we are starting off with, it actually implies this. And that's why we can form a conjunction because um, in an implication, that is true. If this part is true, then it also guarantees that this is true. And you can always keep appending additional components that are implied by other components of a conjunction to a conjunction. 
Is that okay? Yeah, that makes yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I just want to re-emphasize, maybe for the fifth time, <laughs> is you know, I made this unnecessarily long because I was <coughs> going for the mechanical method, just to illustrate that this is really a a usable approach for theorem proving, because you can do all this using a double loop. Does that um, make sense? I, yeah. Yeah. I also had a question. Yeah. Um. So I did a little bit differently. Um, actually, so what I did was I uh, foiled out the original no, CNF no, statement. No, 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 you don't want to foil. No? No. Uh, that is not resolution. Is that not... Okay, well, I didn't, yeah, I didn't use resolution at all, but I still arrived to the same, like, um, uh, conclusion. Is that, that's just, like, not, a, not the way to go? Uh, it's not the way to go because the title of the homework assignment? Got it. <laughs> And also the description. Okay, got it. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, you know, if you want to prove this, you know, one way to prove this, you know, it, that it leads to a contradiction, believe it or not, is a truth table. Yeah, you can use a truth table to prove this too. So, how many uh, variables do we have? We have Q, R, S, T, right? We got four variables in this case. So the truth table is going to be a little bit lengthy. It's going to have 16 items in it, okay? But th how do we prove this leads to a contradiction using a, using a truth table? Does anyone want to guess? Okay, so let me, let me just kind of illustrate what I mean by that. So you have a truth table. We have Q, R, S, T. And then we look at the expression that is starting out the entire thing. Okay, so we look at this, and I'll paste it at the end here, which is here. Okay, so you know there it's there are going to be sixteen rows because two to the power of four is sixteen. So each row is representing a unique combination of which variable is true and which variable is false. So what do you think is going to happen to this column? Come on, you guys can do it. Give it a guess. No. Which column? The column that I am, the, the cursor is on. Okay, I just moved the cursor. Uh, okay. I'm referring to this column here. So if you look at this as a table, what do you think is going to happen to this particular column? It, it's all going to be false. No matter how what combination of true and false you have with Q, R, S, T, this expression is always going to be false. So you can actually prove by contradiction using a truth table. Is that okay? Or you guys are just not buying it? Either I need to see it, or I'd have to do it to really understand how that's going to work. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay, so what tool do I use to prove this? Now, you can write a C program easily to do this, okay? So your, your, your C program just has to iterate through uh, every single possible true-false value for QRST, and then plug each one into this uh, expression here. Uh, so you can do it that way too. Okay, you can definitely use a C program to do this, and I will leave it as a ungraded assignment for you guys to try to do that. But instead of doing it this way, okay. So instead of doing it that way, we're gonna go to Office, and you guessed it, we'll use a spreadsheet to do it. Okay, so spreadsheets are extremely useful, you know, for something like this, and. There's the long and easy way, long way to do this, and there's the easy way to do this. Uh, the long way to do this involves a little bit more coding. Um, so we got four columns, Q, R, S, T. So we can either populate this manually, or we can populate this um, automatically. So I'm gonna show you a trick of how to 
populate this manually, I mean uh, automatically using a program. So we're going to insert a new column, uh, insert column before, and we'll just have a variable called n here. Okay, n is pretty easy, n just goes from, it just increments for each row. And we're going to need 16 rows, so we're going to go up to row 17. So basically we have, we end up with values from 0 to 15. Um, if you think about it, you know, 0 to 16 are the values that can be contained within a 4-bit number, right? So Q is basically one of the bits of the 4-bit number, R is another bit, S is another bit, and then T is yet another bit. Is that okay so far? Maybe? Okay, okay. yeah, I follow. Okay. So we want to extract these bits, but using a somewhat automatic mechanism, so I don't have to do this conversion manually. So we'll just say that, you know, uh, Q is bit 0 of N, okay? R is bit 1, S is bit 2, and then T is bit 3. Is that okay? Yes? Yeah, okay. that makes sense. Okay. So now the question is, how do we extract that bit? Now, if you took, if you're currently taking assembly language from me, you remember this equation, hopefully. <laughs> it is the floor of uh, whatever value we have divided by uh, whatever base we have to the digit number, okay, which is i, and then uh, the whole thing uh, mod, okay, well, that's fine. This, this is just pseudocode, so it's good. It's okay to put a mod here. And then mod whatever base we're dealing with. Okay, uh, do you guys remember this? Yeah, vaguely. <laughs> Vaguely, okay. Well, vaguely is better than not, okay? So we, we, we'll, we'll use this equation to extract a particular bit, okay? So I'm keeping this over here just as comment, okay? So now we have to enter the actual equation here. So we're taking a look at the floor of V, which in this case is just N, divided by, uh, the, the base is 2 because we are looking at the whole thing as a base 4 number. So 2 to the power of whatever the digit is. So the digit is controlled by the column number. Column B is just column. Uh, that will give us the actual column number. And then the column number is, I think it's, uh, it's one oriented. The first column is one. So this has to be minus two. Okay, and then we close the floor. And uh, whatever this thing is, we have to do a mod of it. Okay, so the mod has to go outside. So we are modding this with the base that we're dealing with, which is 2. And we'll see whether this works or not. Okay, so we'll, we'll expand it sideways like this. They should all be zeros. And then we'll expand it this way. It will look like um, base 4 numbers, but uh, it's a mirror image. Oh, man, it doesn't work. Okay, why is it? Oh, okay, I know why it's not working. Because n is um, a cannot change, cannot cannot uh, cannot change. So I I did a dollar sign for when I refer to a two, and then the other ones should be okay. So let's do it one more time. So we expand it sideways first, and then vertically like that. Ta-da! Isn't that cool? No, nobody, nobody cares. No, that's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's really kind of cool because uh, it's I, I'm basically combining uh, what I teach in uh, CISP 310, which is base two conversion, to uh, also apply in this class because I just need to quickly generate the truth table. Now, if you say tech, you know, in the amount of time you figure this out and type out all the formula, you could have just you know hand typed in all the zeros and ones. I will not argue against that, okay, when there are only four variables. If you have six or seven variables, I can easily argue this approach is going to work a whole lot faster compared to entering each and every single cell manually. And needless to say, this way, you know, I, I, you know, I don't have to risk making a stupid mistake, you know, entering a single digit wrong. Okay, so now we look at the equation or the expression that we're dealing with. So we'll take this, okay, and put it here, you know, just as comments, okay, to, because I need to look at it while I enter the actual expression. 
So might as well put it as a header. Okay, there we go. So the entire thing is a big huge and, um, and an and can take multiple components. Uh, and then each component is an or. So the first one is the negation of Q, the negation of R, the negation of S. There we go. All right, so that's the first disjunctive term. The second disjunctive term is another OR, and then the negation of Q, the negation of R, the negation, oh, not negation, this time it's non-negated, just T itself, which is here. And then we have three more terms, which is just Q, R, and then not T. So we have Q, R, and then the negation of T, which is this guy over here. So close, close, there we go. And if I copy the same formula down, it should be false for every single cell. There we go. So this is another way to prove that this expression here, or you know, in the original thing here, so this is another way to prove that this expression is always false. And because it is always false, that means the original uh, proposed theorem is a theorem. So is everybody kind of getting the idea of how to yet another way to use uh, proof by contradiction, but not using a resolution at all? This time I'm just using um, a truth table. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, so will you also please, because um, I've just been following along rather than typing, uh, would you share that, that um, Excel sheet or the, the spreadsheet with us somehow? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let me do this. Copy, uh, save it first. I think this will work in uh, Google Sheet too. Well, I'm I in my head right now, I just have like, a bazillion ideas of how to do this. I just have to figure out one way. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll just name, name it in today's lecture. 20200330. Ooh, that's a cool date. Somewhat cool date. Okay, and then we'll switch to here. And I'll just send it as an announcement, as an attachment in an announcement. Would that okay? Would that be okay? Would that be okay? That's perfect, yeah. All right. Yeah, I could also do an attachment in a Discord, but not everybody's on Discord. I don't want people to complain to me later on. Okay. There we go. There we go. Right now, it's an ODS file, but Excel can open ODS files, and so can Google Sheet. So once you get the file, you can open it in just about any spreadsheet program. All right. Now, if th you think this is cool, there's something even 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 more, well, just as cool. Okay. Uh, let me change my cursor back. There we go. So if you make a conjunction, okay. If you make a conjunction between uh, the original negated theorem to, which is not even a CNF, if you make uh, a CNF, if you make a conjunction out of this, and also the uh, the starting point of the previous assignment, which is the CNF assignment, if you make a conjunction out of those two, that and make a truth table out of it, it will all be false too. Does that make sense? Say that one more time. Okay, so let me switch back to the browser first. Okay, so we'll switch back to the browser and go to the previous assignment, the CNF assignment. Okay, so we'll go to, oops, too, too, 
far. There we go. All right. So if you are to take this expression and then end it with what we worked on today, which is the negative theorem here, that conjunction, if you make a truth table out of that conjunction, it will still look like this table here. It will all be false. Because the whole idea of a CNF is it still expresses exactly the same logic as the original expression, except the format is different. Is that okay? Yes. Makes okay. Sense. Yeah, so truth table you know can be used you know uh, you know in many ways in this class, um, except the, the problem with the truth table is it always increases the mo the number of rows of a truth table is always exponential to the number of variables, so that part you know is kind of you know makes it sometimes it's not as convenient to use. Is that okay? Works for me. All right, cool, excellent. All right, so um, we are done with CNF and resolution, I think. Um, are there any other questions related to CNF, resolution, and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. One, uh, one more. Can you mm -hmm. pull up where you were doing the assignment where you ended together the uh, negated CNF for the second one we're supposed to prove with what we have? I think so. This is the second one. Yeah, um, okay. So you see uh, on that uh, right after the I can, next I can, line. Hold on, hold on. Let me turn on uh, line numbers. Oh, perfect. There we go. So line number 21. Uh-huh. So this was the question I had earlier when I said, uh, will it, uh, be an issue if you take out things. So uh, you have Q and not Q in the disjunction. So technically it is accurate if you said that statement equals, um, if you want to type it as I say it so you can see it. Uh, so equals n parenthesis not R or not S. Mm -hmm. Which is... This is the this is the result of the resolution, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Times that, uh, not a uh, parenthesis, not R or T. Times Q, times R, times not T. Um, and that the, is yeah. So in ahead. the end, it is like that. But how did you get to this point? So that can be seen by a truth table. P and not P or Q using any generic P and Q uh -huh. is equal to P and Q. Um, oh, it's because, well, but that's also because of the resolution. Because once we do the resolution, you can see how this term is generated, right? But remember mm -hmm. in a uh, conjunction, when you have a term like mm. this, which is more restrictive, and then you have a term like this, which is less restrictive, you can oh, always get okay. yeah, you can always get rid of the one that is less restrictive and keep the one that is more restrictive. Okay, so that's how. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that answers my question fully. Yeah. Then. Yeah, but the way I did this, you know, was to not to use any type of simplification and purely using resolution. There's n there's no other linear algebra, I mean, a Boolean algebra used in here, except for resolution. Okay. Um, also, one more thing about that. Um, since I did it the other way and I did all the foiling out, is that <laughs> way it's still valid? It's just not what you wanted? Like, is that still one way to prove it by contradiction? It's just not what you wanted? That is correct, because the whole point of the homework assignment is to apply resolution. Okay, uh, I thought it was just use whatever method proved by contradiction, and resolution was one of those methods. So sorry, that was just what I was under the impression. Okay, yeah. So yeah, well, it's it's good to have it you know brought out you know now instead of having to brought this out in the exam. <laughs> yeah, no, the exactly. Exam, you know, it's gotta hurt a little bit more um, if the question is not. 
red yeah yeah so in the exam if you're not sure you know go ahead and ask me you know so that brings us to the second topic of today's lecture the exam exam two so I think what I'll do um, let me see if I can make this assumption can I assume that everybody has a computer or a mobile device on which um, you can use um, let me see uh, Google document or Google spreadsheet would that be a valid assumption that you can use Google Doc or Google sheet uh, during the exam does anyone uh, not yeah. have the resources to do it so okay so if that is a valid resource that I can assume then the second exam is going to make use of Google Doc and or Google sheet okay so, so Sounds good. Yeah, so I still haven't worked out all the details yet, you know, because it depends on how much time I can spend on programming Google Script. Because I my intention is to generate a test for each person in the class. And I will send you and share with you the document that each person is supposed to work on. And I'll have you know, tr uh, track changes you know, turn on. So that way, you know, I can actually see how a document is edited or modified over time, how the answers are put in, blah, 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 like that. I can play Super Big Brother. Okay. Okay, nobody's laughing. It's, it's, oh. <laughs> is it going to require, like, a proficiency in Google Sheet? Um, no. So the idea of using Google Sheet is simply to use Google Sheet as a way to present the question. Especially when the question itself, you know, is in the form of a table, um, it's oh, also a way for you to put in an answer, so that when I collect the exams, I can apply another Google script to, you know, potentially auto grade some of the questions. Okay. But no, you do not need to be proficient with the formulae in a spreadsheet. I'm only using a spreadsheet as a way for data entry. So would that be okay? No questions? Oh, yeah, this was checking. Thank you. Okay. All right. So that's going to be uh, what my plan is because I have about two weeks you know, before the second exam. So the second exam is going to be on the Wednesday after the break, not the Monday. Because, you know, it's we are already more than halfway through today's lecture and only got half an hour left to start talking about the practice exam. So I will make the official second exam date the Wednesday after the break. Do we have any uh, objection to that? I, I actually I have yeah. one more question about it. So if yeah. you were going to do an individual test for everybody, are they going to be the same question with just like very, very different tweaks? Or like, because... Uh, I would imagine it would be easy to make it harder. Okay, so the intention is to make it so that um, potentially the questions can be different, but equivalent. Okay. So, so it will be equivalent from the perspective of you know no one should encounter a question that is harder to answer than other people, but okay. it will be different from the perspective of you know they may look different. Okay, that makes sense. Like versions, yeah. Yep. Which okay. is already kind of the case with the uh, with exam one. It's just that you know it's it it's 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 already automatically generated by a program. Except I have to rewrite that program uh, in Google Script, and I have to output it instead of using LaTeX. I have to output it in the form of either Google Doc or Google Sheet. Hello. Hello. Uh, Oh, I was just making sure you could hear me. Um, so for if we do it on Google Docs, we would just input the answer on there, yep. and we could do the work on a separate piece of paper. Um, you can how definitely would that work. work. You can work on it on like, a separate piece of paper, um, but I'm guessing that I would formulate the question so that you know they, they will they will in they will be in steps. So you won't be, you know, like you know, finishing the entire calculation off of the sheet, and then just have to input the 
only final answer, you'll be working along, you know, using this the sheet or the doc. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hey, Zach. Yeah. Hey, just to confirm, so you're saying the test is going to be next Wednesday? It'll be not week, next Wednesday. Next week is spring break. Believe it or not, we actually have a spring break. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so no, not next week. It is the, the Wednesday after the break. I can look at my gotcha. calendar and find out what date it really is. Um, I'm, not, I'm usually not very conscious about you know what day I'm in or what day next week. Looks is. like the 15th, I think. Yeah, so it's going to be the 15th. That is correct. Thank you. So, uh, so two more things. Um, yeah. So, if we're yeah. Gonna, uh, how concerned uh, are you going to be about us showing our work, like for partial credit and stuff like that? Um, I think showing work is going to be important, uh, especially because this is a fully online test. So, I do need people to show work. So, we should do the work in the Google Sheets? Yes. And I'll, and I'll, yeah, so I'll try to you know, specify in the instruction and break a question into multiple steps so that you guys can you know, fill in those steps within the document or the sheet. Okay, sounds good. All right. And the time frame is going to be the same time as the lecture time. In other words, you know, it's going to be from noon to 1.20. So it's not like you know your actual typical online class where you can have you can do it within two days and any time within those two days. So we're going to do it in the same format as a face-to-face -face class, except you're doing it remotely. Okay, it looks like there are also other questions in the general text chat. Okay, I am taking a l oh. Why would they put it onto the general ch chat instead of today's specific chat? Alrighty. Okay, so Alex has a question. Oh, extra time is easy to deal with, uh, Alex. Um, so I can um, arrange with you individually uh, about the extra time. Okay, so any other question? Yeah, my internet has been shaky, shaky recently. If internet goes down, can we reschedule the test? Hmm. That is an interesting question. Yeah, I have only solved my internet issues by just plugging into Ethernet, but I had to stretch the cable across the entire house. <laughs> if it works, it works. Hmm. Okay. Let me think about this one a little bit. Um. Worst come to worst, um, you can use a phone to do it. You know, can does Peter have a phone that has a reliable internet connection? Because I don't think you know uh, this test will need a lot of bandwidth. Well, you but know? then showing work on a phone, I mean, that's that's gonna be hard. No, no, t tethering. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, but Peter doesn't have a smartphone. Okay. Hmm. Well, since it's in two weeks, you know, we'll 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 reassess the situation on the Monday. Ripley's, what what is that? Believe it or not. Oh, believe it or not. Okay, I w I was more thinking about uh, Murphy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Murphy's law. If it can go wrong at the pos worst possible moment, it will go wrong at the worst possible moment. Yeah, exactly. Not just go wrong, but the, at the worst possible moment. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to wait for Peter's typing and going to the share drive also. Okay. So do we have anything else on general? Okay. So Alex says okay. So just remind me, Alex, uh, about the uh, uh, DSPS requirements. You know, you can you can uh, direct message me about that. Okay. And then getting back to here. All right, so I did upload an additional test for exam two. So now we have a few exam twos up here. Oh, okay, I see. Okay. All right, so we look at um, 
this is the latest or the last time when I taught this class last time this was their exam too <laughs> yeah, cross your fingers and toes <laughs> well it's possible that my internet goes down too <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh my god. Uh, now I have an excuse to tell all the kids to stop playing their games during the exam. No YouTube, no games, you know, I have the internet to myself. Alright, so we'll just go ahead and take a quick look at the uh, previous time, the last time I taught this class. Um, it's definitely still open book and open notes, okay? You know, and uh, I'm gonna say, you know, it's gonna be open internet as long as we do not use it for live communication, okay? So I think that's a fair, you know, uh, thing to do for an online test like this. Is you know, it's not just uh, printed or handwritten because you know I'm assuming that we are all going to be sitting in front of a computer, possibly with phones and other mobile devices. So you can use the internet, except you cannot um, do y you cannot have live communication with another person during the test. But you can certainly right click on a question and then say you know search Google search for that. Is that okay? I don't I don't hear any cheering. Like woohoo! Yes. <laughs> I I don't I don't think Google has the answer to your jam. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, well, it may, you know, I don't know. Um, <laughs> all right, but it is still an individual assessment, you know, um, so, you know, I just want to re-emphasize that, not for this class, but in uh, CISP 310 this semester, uh, I have a suspected case of people copying from each other, which is not good, you know, I really don't, which I wish I don't have to deal with that, but I do. So, um, so it's an individual test. Um, obviously, if I if we're doing this in um, Google Doc or Google Sheet, it's no longer a problem to attach additional pieces of paper. So from that perspective, it's easier on me as well. I don't have to destaple, scan, and then restaple stuff. Um, I'm going to minimize writing, so as long as people can type um, and no one is complaining about I cannot type, I can only write, okay, you know, if there if there's are no complaints about that, we'll just be typing the answers. Um, it will still be 20% of your final grade, okay, and you want to show steps as much as possible. Um, and because I'm going to use the simplified notation that can all that can be typed on the regular keyboard, um, so and you can copy and paste. Remember, this is online, so you can copy and paste from one line to another line. So that makes it easier, I think, you know, to show all the steps involved. So we'll take a look at the uh, scope here. So the first question is, well, guess what? Something that you're already familiar with. Uh, re-express something as a CNF and I have a proposed theorem and I want you to use uh, proof uh, by contradiction and resolution to show whether uh, the proposed theorem is a theorem or not. So once again this is really just a you know kinda uh, a variation of your homework assignment. The current one and the one that was due last week or Monday. Okay, we got some questions here. Oh, we're gonna ask: Are we yeah. gonna use that? Do that U generation thing or no? Um, the U generation assignment. It doesn't look like it has like points or like a due date. So I was yeah, ask I I that. told I totally forgot about assigning it. So I'm not gonna. Um, so I will try to assign it at the end of today. <laughs> um, but you 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 probably have the entire um, break and also you know maybe possibly. Yeah, you'll have an entire break to work on it, and so you have two weeks to work on it. Will it take that long, or is it just no? <laughs> no. Okay, I'm making sure. It depends on uh, my pro my homework assignments tend not to be like super tedious. So if it was long, it is not because you know you need to type a lot. It is because you know you need to understand a lot of concepts first. Is that okay? Yeah, I, I thank you. Okay. So question two or five is out of scope because I don't 
think I have covered, or we haven't really done the homework assignment for uh, the U or the Omega generator. So doing those will definitely help with this type of homework assignment, uh, this type of question. So question two or combination and permutation is out of scope for exam two for this semester. Is that okay? All right. So don't worry about permutation or combination for exam two. And then question two or five is one of those questions. Question three or five is proof by <coughs> contradiction that the following is true for all Boolean values P, Q, and R. Show all steps. So in this case, um, you can be, sh be sure to use all st show all steps uh, of proof by con of proof by contradiction as well as Boolean algebra. <laughs> so in this case, you know, since I did not say that you have to use uh, resolution and note that you cannot use resolution because we are trying to prove that resolution works. Um, this is actually just you know resolution itself, um, and you cannot use the proof in the module for resolution because you know you can just copy and paste it. So the intention of this original question is uh, just show me a truth table. <laughs> is that okay? Does everybody understand what I mean by that? You're saying just construct a truth table so that it matches patient? Well, now you have to be a little bit careful because the truth table has to be on the negated <coughs> theorem. This is the theorem itself. You have to negate it first. So you just want us to do a, just figure out another way to prove it. Oh, you're saying R is the negated. Oh, theorem. I take it. I take it back. You know, proof by truth table. Well, in in this particular question, it says you know, proof by proof by truth table cannot be used, um, but it, it you know it is it can actually be used if you negate the theorem first. It, does ev does everybody understand what I mean by this? Can you uh, tell us? Okay, so go ahead. So if you want to prove this by contradiction, but use a proof table to do that, then you have to first take this equation, take this expression, negate the entire expression, okay? And then you come up with a truth table uh, and show that the negated expression is always false, no matter what P, Q, and R are. That is still proof by contradiction because you're proving this expression is always false, or the negated version of this expression is always false. Okay, so we could do that or use resolution? Uh, it says it cannot use resolution, so you can use uh, uh, Boolean algebra. Oh, all right. So when you use Boolean algebra, you take the negation of this, and then you just use Boolean algebra to eventually derive a zero out of it. Oh, okay, so no now, even though this one is a proof by contradiction, and in the module we have a pr direct proof, can someone think of a way to just leverage whatever is in the module to prove by contradiction? Okay, let, let, me, let me go back to the module that talks about this, and then I'll give you the idea of how to do it. Okay, so let me scroll back to... Propositional logic. All right, so we get to resolution. Okay, so this resolution, this proof, okay, is a direct proof. The reason why it is a direct proof is because it starts with the theorem that I want to prove without the negation, and eventually it goes to a true, which basically means this implication is always true, okay? So now we switch back to the exam, or the uh, practice exam, which is the same thing, okay? Can everybody see how these two theorems are actually the same, even though one is using Greek letters and the other one is, is using English letters? They are really the same thing. Is that okay? okay? Yes? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so the idea is to put a negation on top of this. Okay, so put a negation. That uh, that goes around this entire thing. Is that okay? All right. So keep that outer negation 
throughout all of these derivations. So by the time you get to here, what do you get? You get the negation of true, which is false. Then you have just proven the whole thing using proof by contradiction. All right. Is that okay? So in other words, for this question, if people know where they need to look, they can do this without really having to learn a whole lot about Boolean algebra. They just need to know, know where to copy the derivation from. So are we good with this one? Question three or five? So you uh, you were kind of explaining the language of the question to us. Um, uh -huh. Will you just try to make sure that the uh, when the actual questions are written that they're you know unambiguous? Yes. And I'll be okay. online as well, and that's why you know it is important for me to be also online. Is if you, if anyone has any questions during the exam, just like in the face-to-face -face one, you know I'll be available to answer those questions. Can you show uh, if, if there's time? Can you show the negated table? Yeah. All right. So I am going to. We use a portion of you know, the spreadsheet that I have already, uh, except this time we only got P, Q, and R, okay, instead of Q, R, S, T. But the, the way it works is about the same. Okay? So we, we only need three variables this time. So we're going to have N, which goes from 0 to 7. Is that what you're asking, Nick? Is to have a spreadsheet? The, oh, well, I mean, we could have done it by hand that would um, negate the whole thing in table mm -hmm. like that. And that right. to me kind of makes sense. I would, uh, you negate this portion. Yeah. Uh, but I want table, you're actually... Okay. Or you just take a... P and then have a, the negated version of that as a... Right, so uh, so the negated version is going to be um, so you put the negated version of the highlighted expression into here, and then you also show me you know p, q, and r, fill those you know, in into the, the into the truth table, and then you have to show that every single row for the expression is false. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So that is still proof by contradiction because we are still showing the negated theorem is always false. Uh, is it possible to do it the forward way of just taking a truth table and showing? You don't want to do it. A di you don't want to do a direct proof because the question says you're proof by contradiction. So you have to look at it as a proof oh, by contradiction. Okay. Yep. Okay. Question four is out of scope because. Um, it is asking about functions. Uh, you'll be adding, um, you'll be adding re uh, relations, right? Yes. So relation will be on this one. So for relations, let me go back to an earlier test that has relations. Um, actually, 1193x1 is going to have it, but it's not. I don't think it's here yet. Okay, let me let me add it here. Okay, so now we have it. Yep, there we go. So you don't have to worry about this kind of question because we are already past uh, functions and set operations. You don't have to worry about this one. This one is asking about the uh, uh, two, the folding, the you know, two-dimensional space folding into a one-dimensional space one. And then this one is. This one you do have to worry about. So we are given a set uh, Y, and we want to choose a subset X of Y, so that X is the largest set such that all relations defined over X must be transitive. And I think I, I made a mistake here. You know, X is supposed to be a subset of Y cross Y. So it's Y Cartesian product with Y. Um, and I want the largest set so that all relations defined over X must be transitive. Hmm. 
Be sure to one explain why you think all relations defined over x must be transitive. No, I, I take it back. Um, y x is a subset of y is still correct. So y is the larger set. Larger set x is the smaller set, but it has to be the largest one so that all relations defined over x must be transitive. And two, show that z, a set z which is a subset of y that has one element more than x and define the relation s over z so that s is not transitive. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. First of all, you know, what is, so the first question is what is transitive? You have to look up the definition and since you know this is going to be an online test you can use the module to look up what is transitive or you can Google search uh, for a transitive relation if you want to do it that way too. And I want x to be a subset of y so that all relations defined over x must be transitive. So you can so the way to think about this one is start with the smallest set first okay that has to be transitive. So can anyone remember regardless of um, of hmm. what is the smallest relation that is transitive? Empty set? An empty set, very good, okay. So we know an empty relation is always transitive. So can we have an empty relation when x itself is empty? The answer is yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the next question is, but is that the largest set in which your know, all relations defined over x is transitive? Okay. So let me let me just write it here because I think talking about it is a little bit more confusing. So it's better to write it down here. Okay. I'm turn off turning off line numbers. Okay. So I'm saying that x is an empty set. So x is definitely a subset of the original set y because the empty set is a subset of every set. Is that okay? <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So now we define a relation over you know, x, but since x itself is empty, the only relation that we can define over x is also the empty set. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. But since R is an empty set, and an empty set is always transitive, so now we say, okay, we have at least found one subset of Y such that every relation you can define over that X is transitive. Is that okay? Yeah, you're saying in general, the right. relation has to be transitive. Right, so now we look at two el one element first. Okay, so we look at the original question. We'll take uh, you know, one number in between, kind of not the largest, not the smallest one. Let's say 24, okay? So x only has one single element, which is 24. So now we look at r over x. Now this time, we, there, are, uh, there are two possibilities. Because r can be empty, another way to define a relation over x this time is 24 relates to 24. Does that make sense? These are the only two possible relations that we can define over uh, over this set X. Does it make sense? Okay, I got someone's mic uh, kind of chopping, cutting in sometimes. Nope, okay. All right, so we look at each one individually. Is the empty set always transitive? Yep. Okay, so this is definitely transitive. So the second question is, is this particular relation, 24, 24, is it transitive over x? It is transitive. Okay, so this is still transitive. Are we good so far? So we can have one element in x so that all relations defined over x are transitive. So now we look, okay, can we make x even larger? Okay, so we can have 24 and one more element in it. Um, let's say 30, okay. Now when you have two elements in x, 
R is a subset of um, X Cartesian product with X, and that becomes 24, 24, 24, 30, 30, 24, and then 30, 30. Do we have any questions about this part? If you have a relation over X when X is when X has 24 and 30, then R has to be as a relation has to be a subset of this particular set here, which is the, just the Cartesian product of X and itself. Do we have any questions about that? Yes, no, maybe. No questions? Okay. So now we have to look at all the possible relations. Okay. So R can be just 24, 24. So when R is 24, 24 and it is defined over X, is this relation um, transitive? Any question? Any, anyone? Okay. Am I still running? Yep, I am still running. Okay. So this is transitive. So the question is how many subsets can we generate out of this R? Or potential how many relations can I generate out of X Cartesian product with X? Come on, you guys know. Because each tuple can be present or absent, right? So this one can be absent or present. This one can be absent or present. So when you have four elements in a set, you can have up to 16 subsets. So now we have to look at all 16 subsets and see whether each one is guaranteed to be transitive or not. Is that okay? No feedback. Okay. That's a lot of subsets. That is a lot of subsets. However, you can also look at it the other way, which is to ask, is one any one of those subsets not transitive? Okay. So now you really have to remember what it means to be transitive. So to for something to be transitive, it means the following. For all elements E, F, G in X, okay? The following has to be true. So the following means, you know, E, R, F, you know, E relates to F, and F, R, G, F, R, G, F relates to G, implies, okay, let me put parentheses around this so that it's clear what we are talking about, okay? This implies that E has to relate to G, okay? So the question is, can I choose EFG somehow to make this statement false? Given that I'm talking about a subset of this particular set here. That's the question. Okay, so I'll give you guys a, a moment to think about this. Okay. All right. So let me give you an example. Um, so let's consider a subset with twenty-four, twenty-four, and twenty-four, thirty, and thirty, thirty. So this is R, and I want to see if this R, this relation, defined over X, is transitive or not. All right. So, can I find a case where this is true, but this is false? Can that happen in this case? What do you so think? With e equals thirty, f equaling thirty, and g. Okay. So, if e and f are both thirty, then you cannot find a g, which means the conjunction is guaranteed false. 
which also means the implication is guaranteed true already. So the first task is to make this part true first. Find me E, F, and G so that E, R, G, e R, F is true, F, R, G is also true. Now we have a few cases where you know, we can make this happen. We can make E, um, we can make E and F both 24, and then we can make G 30. Is that okay? Is that, is that okay? But if E and F are the same, then E R G is also guaranteed. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So that means, you know, when you only have two elements in X, um, every single relation you can possibly define over that particular set is guaranteed to be transitive. Because you cannot pick uh, E, F, and G as different elements, as three different elements. Actually, I take it back. Okay, I take it back. This is a case where it is not transitive. You can have 24, 30, 30, 24. There we go. Okay. It's not transitive. Can anyone see why this is not transitive? There's no third value to relate to. Um, no, you can, you can, okay, so getting back to the EFG notation here, you can choose E to be 24, F to be 30, and then G to be 24 again. Do you see how if I choose E to be uh -huh. 24, F to be 30, and G to be 24, the conjunction is true because, you know, 24 relates to 30, okay, because 24, 30 is a tuple. And then 30 relates to 24 is also a tuple, which means 34 also relates to, uh, 30, 30 also relates to 24. So I make the conjunction true. But now the question is, does 24 relate to itself? Nope, 24 does not relate to itself. So now we have an implication where the left-hand side is true, but the right-hand side is false, which means the implication itself is going to be false. So you cannot have uh, a two-element subset where every relation defined over it is guaranteed to be transitive. So the largest subset you can have is when you only have one single element in the set. So that becomes, that's the answer. I, is that okay? Right. Does, uh, does everybody see how I got to the answer? Now, I did not just remember the answer from last time because I have a very limited, you know, buffer in terms of what I can actually remember in the short term. So I just worked this out by hand. But can everybody see how I derived the answer? I start with the smallest set that is guaranteed to be transitive. So when x is empty, then the only relation it can define that can be defined over x is also an empty relation, and that is guaranteed to be transitive. So we, we know this one is always going to be transitive. So the next question is, if I have only one element in x, does that also guarantee that every single relation defined over x is transitive? Well, that one is pretty easy to work out, because when you only have one single element in X, then you only have two possible relations. One is the empty relation, and the other one is the only the, is the relation that relates the only element back to itself, and both of those are transitive. So when we increase the number of elements to two, you know, having 24 and 30, then we found a counterexample, because we can make this part of the implication true, but make this impl this part of the implication false, and I think that's going to be the trickiest part: is how do you figure out, you know, that we can how to how to make this true, but you know, making this false, and that becomes kind of the, you know, that I I would say that's the more time-consuming part of answering this question, is to figure out how to make that happen. So are we do okay. We are five minutes over, so I think I'm going to finish the practice test on Wednesday. But if you guys have any additional questions related to this question, we can go ahead and address that now.
Now, I'm actually unsure. Are we doing this on the upcoming exam? Because I swear we did this prior, uh, like on the first one. We didn't do relations on the first one. We did functions oh. on the first one. Oh, okay. Yeah, I specifically uh, put relations uh, into the second exam and not in the first exam. Okay. Yep. All right. Shall we conclude today's lecture? All right. All right. So I'm going to stop the live stream for now. And I'll leave the voice chat. You guys can still hear me because I'm still voice chatting. So for those of you who want to ask questions right away, you know, I'm uh -huh. here to answer. Yep. Hello. Uh, would it be possible to upload all the stuff that you wrote, um, including the homework assignment and and what we just went over from the mouse pad as I a can, PDF? Uh, I can copy and paste it as is. Okay. Cool. Thank because, you. Because you also have the video, so you know, and you can always work it out from the video. Yeah, just the text would be great. Thank you. Yeah. About that. yeah. Oh, okay. And we'll, and we'll be going over more review on Wednesday. Yes. So on Wednesday, we'll continue with the rest of the first exam, you know, to cover all the other relation related topics. So the second exam is going to be mostly on relations um, and, CN, uh, and uh, propositional logic. So when I say propositional logic, it is much more specifically. Um, resolution, uh, turning an expression into CNF, and proof by contradiction. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. And I also had another question on your home page on Canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, three different exams. Are those the same as the ones that are shared on your Google Drive? I do not think so because uh, the ones shared on the Google Drive are newer ones. So when you look at the ones on the Google Drive, oh, maybe they are. So I have, um, this is uh, 2016, 2017 uh, spring. And then on the, okay, l let me paste this first so that you know, I don't forget to do it. Gonna do it the super lazy way. Okay, so would that work? Just basically all the everything in my notepad today. Um, I can't see your screen, but yeah, if you could upload it or oh, send okay, us an email. Oh, okay, right, right. The uh, the YouTube stuff is still going. Um, oh. Okay. Yeah, but it's okay. It's it's going to be recorded in the YouTube one, and I can stop.